So we've got a dynamite panel for the uh, event this evening. So the first person, I'd love to give you each a, a round of applause here as they come up. Dr. Richard Isaacson is, is at the forefront of preventative neurology and preventative Alzheimer's prevention. And uh, we're so glad that you could be here, Dr. Isaacson. So Dr. Isaacson, can you join us here? The next guest is Mr. Kale himself, uh, New York uh, uh, Columbia University assistant uh, professor of psychiatry and uh, author of Fifty Shades of Kale, Dr. Drew Ramsey. I also was really excited to have the opportunity to uh, bring in uh, Dr. Maya Shatree Klein. She is a pediatric neurologist. Uh, she is working at the forefront of brain mending. It's the name of her clinic. And uh, we're really excited to have to give you a, pediatric, a view on uh, pediatric health concerns. Dr. Maya Shatree Klein. And then uh, I was going to sit on the end, but I think uh, we should probably have Dr. Lombard up as well, and I'll sit in the audience. So um, you want to sit there? Uh, Dr. Lombard will be here for questions as well. All right, I'm going to come and sit here, and we'll have questions from the audience. I'll come around in a minute, but I'm just maybe going to start here. So um, first question for you, Drew. You know, when I was telling the, um, you, know, you just have to flick the mic on, just flick it up and you'll get the, uh, get the thing there. So, La Senado, La Senado. <laughs> when, um, you know, when I told our, our team at um, our, our you know, medical advisory board that we were getting, you know, the, the, the smartest, sexiest psychiatrist, you know, in New York on the functional forum, they said, but, but you guys always have Kelly Brogan. She's spoken like four <laughs> times. So I just said, well, we'll just use Drew. He's good. So Drew, quick question. Kale Day was last week. Um, awesome press. A lot of great things happening. Just for the people out there, I mean, you're a psychiatrist. Can, can Kale save us from, from psychiatric uh, meltdown? We've gotten to the point, James, only Kale can save us now. <laughs> as, as, uh, yeah, so Kale saved me, and I think it saved a lot of us in terms of, uh, uh, I just really felt with all the controversies in health and mental health, I wanted something that we could all believe in, and, uh, and that was Kale. And, and, and then as opposed to what we've done in medicine for a long time, was telling people what not to eat and what to avoid, of just something that we can all agree on, this is healthy to eat, and to learn the lessons of that food. So. I do believe that, that kale can save us um, as it helps us eat in a way that supports our microbiome, supports our overall health, is anti-inflammatory, and also supports the health of the planet, right? You can grow kale anywhere. Everybody can afford kale. And so I just thought it was a, a nice set of lessons, and it's been really wonderful watching people get excited about kale. So out of the 300,000 kids that got a free kale salad last Wednesday, how many of it was eaten, how many of it was thrown at another classmate, and how much of it was uh, tossed out? Do you have well, any numbers on that? Well, so I got to sit at uh, PS87 with Bill Telepan, a Michelin-starred chef, and, and watch him serve kale to 900 kids. And, and then I got to sit at a table with these kids. And, and a lot of people have this experience on National Kale Day. We think kids won't eat healthy food, and that's just not true. When you sit down, and, and it was amazing. We started with the kale chips, and they said, oh, this is great. Where's this come from? So it was like a big pile of kale. I said, oh, it comes from here. So can we eat that too? I said, yeah, eat the raw kale. Sure. So they ate the raw kale. Said, That's pretty good. Where do these kale plants come from? And they had baby kale plants. So we brought over the tray of baby kale plants, little sprouts. They said, can we eat those too? And little hands started just digging at the little baby kale plants. And so it's a gateway drug. It's a, <laughs> it's a <laughs> it's gateway plant. <laughs> so it, it's uh, so a lot of kids ate kale, and I think our is we is I love the uh, I think it's the farm to school philosophy. Don't yuck my yum, right? Not everybody loves kale. You don't have to love kale to eat healthy, but let's let's uh, get kids trying more fun, nutrient dense foods like kale and seeing if we can make an impression. I think that's such such a great thing, and you know, Dr. Ramsey is a great example of someone just taking initiative to do someone do something amazing. And in two years, it's just had such a great effect. And we've got a master plan to take it even bigger next year. So um, watch this space, Dr. Isaacson. I'd love to just ask you, just you know, for for those of you who are unfamiliar with your work, what is it that gets you so passionate about basically doing um, Alzheimer's prevention to thirty year olds with no symptoms? So, I mean, Alzheimer's d disease in the brain, I'm, I'm always been fascinated by the brain since I was probably this big. But actually, I have a family history of Alzheimer's disease. I have four family members. Uh, my great uncle Bob was diagnosed when I was in high school. I actually uh, diagnosed my uh, dad's cousin at a wedding several years ago. So I've actually seen kind of the evolution of our understanding of Alzheimer's disease when I was this big, and now I'm a little bit, little bit like that. Um, and the disease starts, as Max said, 20 to 30 years 
before we diagnose it. Uh, it's just like heart disease and diabetes. It's the same thing, but neurologists, primary care docs, we just haven't been taught to think that way. So 30-year-olds and no symptoms, that's when we need to think about Alzheimer's prevention. That's amazing. I mean, I have a family history too, and I'm excited. So, what are what are some of the what are some of the ways that you are uh, engaging change? And are other neurologists and, and people interested in this? Uh, baby steps. <laughs> We're making progress. <laughs> I started the Alzheimer's Prevention Clinic uh, at the New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell Medical Center in New York City um, a year ago, uh, July 2013. I've actually been see seeing Alzheimer's prevention patients. Um, family members of Alzheimer's patients for about the last five years. Um, and uh, went over to University of Alabama in Birmingham uh, in March, and they just started a couple months ago. Uh, we have uh, the folks from Brazil coming uh, for a site visit in, in December. Uh, and then actually we're having a uh, New York Academy of Sciences is actually sponsoring a nutrition and brain health and dementia prevention conference. This has not, not exactly happened before. People from Oxford and Norway and National Institutes of Health. I mean, it's uh, it's all kind of converging. So. Right. Baby steps, uh, that's number one. Uh, number two, um, there's so much we can do to take control of our brain health. Um, there's no one magic pill, there's no way to prevent Alzheimer's or cure Alzheimer's yet, but based on really spectacular data, one out of three cases of Alzheimer's is preventable, period. Okay. When I used to say Alzheimer's and prevention in the same sentence, they would you know, throw tomatoes at me. <laughs> um, that was seven years ago. And a couple of years ago, they'd look at me like this, and now it's okay. Um, so, you know, there's no one-size-fits-all approach. Again, like Max said, um, I take a pretty comprehensive approach. Um, nutritional, uh, obviously, is key. Exercise, lifestyle changes, um, environmental factors, um, uh, exciting things like musical experience, lifelong musical, musical experience. I had to join a rock band. Um, very specific vitamins. Actually, actually, I did. Um, uh, I have a blisters from playing last Sunday, but um, I mean, anything and everything as long as it's safe and grounded in scientific evidence. Um, and it really depends on genetics, too. Um, that's, what, that's, what we've, that's what we're learning. So, I mean, just one more question. I mean, you, you've been practicing ahead of the science for a little bit, and now you're, you're doing it. So w what are we going to, what should we be practicing now so that we're doing the science from five years' time? Right. Uh, so basically, in the United States, it takes 15 years for something that's proven in science to be translated into clinical medicine. It drives me crazy. Um, so I read something, and, and as long as it's grounded and, and, and safe, I, I implement it. Uh, what can we do? Get educated and get informed. I mean, we're, um, we're, we're working on things. We're trying to educate people online. We have uh, Alzheimer's courses, Alzheimer's prevention courses, all free, all online, evidence-based, reviewed uh, by specialists. Um, I think that Getting educated and getting informed is absolutely essential. Uh, getting out there, um, uh, can I talk about a, a thing that we're working on? A project? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so Fair it's enough. called Alzheimer's Universe, um, alzu.org, .org, alzu.org. Uh, it's not like a promo, but it's, it's completely free. It's completely nonprofit. It's completely Cornell, Columbia. Um, all sorts of places all around the country and around the world. Uh, you can learn about what, you, you know, what everyone can do uh, online from the comfort of your iPad, iPhone, whatever. That's great. Dr. Shatri Klein, let me uh, introduce you here. I've been a, a big fan of your work for a long time, really care about the autism community and, and particularly environmental pediatrics. Your work is all on, on brain mending. First of all, before we get into mending the brain, what do you see as, as sort of the major factors that are driving brains that need to be mended? Well, I think, you know, I originally got involved in this work because I started to see so many children when I went into practice who um, were really ill and were medicated, coming to me on three, four, five uh, different neuropsychiatric medications, um, which was pretty mind-boggling in five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, 13-year-olds. Um, and no one saw any reason to really change that. So, um, and a lot of parents, it seemed like, also felt their kids were sitting ducks and they were waiting for what was going to happen to their kids. So. I started to um, look at food as the first evidence-based treatment. Um, and it was really unbelievable, actually very startling, because I didn't have a lot of experience with that when I first uh, began to practice. But changing diet was so transformative in kids because they are um, very resilient, usually. Um, and and their brains are very plastic. So the kinds of building blocks were healthy fats. I mean, things we've talked about here, kale and all the cruciferous vegetables that are, you know, full of sulforaphanes, activating NRF2, turning on brain-derived neurotrophic factor, 
um, and turning and gut flora, so fermented foods, probiotics, um, and kefir and things like that, which are really powerful because everything in the brain um, begins in the gut, and I think that the gut is soil for the brain to grow. So if you have an unhealthy gut and you're not absorbing your nutrients and you're not being nourished well, it doesn't matter what you're eating. Um, so gut health, um, vegetables, and um, actually I encourage kids also, um, I don't think that kids, a lot of young kids do terrifically well on a very strict paleo diet actually, um, but I definitely work with whole grains and you know, in sort of smaller amounts, I think, than average. Um, definitely avoiding processed carbohydrates um, and sugar. What's, what's medicine going to look like when the current crop of autistic kids are now adults? Well, I mean, I think it's not just the kids with autism, although, you know, we're looking at increases that are pretty astronomical at this point. So we're looking at kids who are, you know, right now around one out of 50, um, in another seven years, we're looking at you know one in two, if it continues at this rate. So pretty terrifying. By um, 2030, I, I heard that those rates will be up there, one in two. There, there, it's it's going up, but we're also looking at a lot of other chronically ill kids with a lot of different conditions, and um, so I mean I think we need to be looking at you know some of the stuff that we saw in some of those great kind of cartoon videos about environmental health looking at how we're growing food, looking at uh, what we're doing in our environment. And I think that actually, although a lot of people find that really hopeless or you know feel pessimistic about it, I think we just all have to start raising our voices, especially as practitioners, because we have that kind of, uh, we have the credentials and we have some authenticity in what we're talking about and we can bring together science and what's happening in clinical medicine. And you know, from my point of view, what I worry about is that even in the integrative medicine community, but certainly in the mainstream medicine community, children are really neglected. They're not sexy, you know, no one really wants to talk about what's going on. And what my colleagues and I are noticing is that kids are getting less resilient, even as we're treating them. And I'm using a lot of food, I'm using botanicals, and I've seen really amazing results with kids, and yet, they're getting sicker and we need to start paying attention to that. It's amazing work. Well, we're going to take a lot of questions here. I actually have one from Twitter that I want to ask you. And I'm going to ask this to Dr. Lombard, but I think you're going to be a little bit biased. So I have to ask all of you. Uh, Will Cole, who's a, a favorite functional medicine doctor from uh, Pennsylvania, he asks, uh, what are your top favorite labs to look at risk factors for brain health problems? I'll start with you, Jay, but we're not going to finish with you because we know well, you're biased. Well, I, I should you know, recuse myself from the uh, answer to the question except to make a point that when we look at biomarkers uh, in mental health and brain health, it's, it's not only genetics. Uh, other biomarkers are as important, something called proteomics, uh, which is really very specific for inflammatory markers for these conditions, uh, like Alzheimer's disease, is increasingly important. Uh, epigenetics will be a very important biomarker for psychiatry. What is the effect of how the environment affects gene expression? Uh, and brain imaging um, will be extraordinarily important for early diagnosis of things like Alzheimer's disease. So I think it's not uh, a commercial endorsement for a lab. I think it's understanding uh, that we need to have an integrative approach uh, of many different types of biomarkers to help prevent conditions in a prodromal stage. So autism, we have a much better success rate to identify those patients earlier on. And if I could just give a, a call out to Armin Aladini, who's a, uh, a celiac spe specialist at Columbia that's done work looking at um, non-celiac uh, uh, proteins associated with autism and schizophrenia. And this is very important because these are very highly elevated in prodromal states. So the ability to actually uh, go on a gluten-free diet before a person develops a florid psychotic episode uh, is very important uh, to commercially get those kinds of diagnostic tests out there for that condition. And uh, of course, I like Genomind. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, what are you uh, doing for kids with, with lab testing here? Well, if we're talking about um, you know predicting brain function um, and disease, I definitely feel I live in the world of epigenetics. Um, so I see a lot of kids that come to me with various different genetic disorders. I think, you know, pediatric neurology is where we see a lot of that. And um, 
So my interest is yes in knowing what the genetics are, and I, you know, I like to look at things like MTHFR and other methylation markers. Um, I do look at some of the, you know, some other genetic kind of detoxification polymorphisms and things like that sometimes. But I also feel like for me, you know, I'm thinking of the body as a basin, and I'm thinking of how can we lessen what's in the basin and how can we open the drain. And I actually find that environmental factors are so powerful in that way, botanicals and food and a lot of other things like, um, you know, talking about music, talking about nature. I mean, there's actually great data for this. And so I think it's dangerous to get too caught up in the genetics, even though I think it's important to know that. Um, but I think there are some good labs and I haven't yet talked to Jay about Genomine, but I will be. Well, let's, uh, let's take some questions from the room. I, I missed my cue earlier, so we are going to get a brief moment of Cypress Hill. So I hope you'll uh, excuse that. Uh, but I'm going to pass the <laughs> tickets on here. Sorry. <laughs> OK, Dana, here we go. <laughs> I know this is one of your favorites. So here we are, Dana Cohen. Welcome. Let's have a question for the panel. Um, OK, uh, so nobody's mentioned me actually um, can you and do you measure neurotransmitters in New York? <laughs> and is it, wor is it worthwhile doing? Well, uh, it's a loaded question. So, so certain urinary neurotransmitters um, are probably correlating with uh, you know, systemic uh, alterations. So for instance, norepinephrine is probably a useful uh, urinary neurotransmitter to detect, but uh, the other ones probably are not. Uh, so measuring, you know, urinary serotonin is is probably a complete waste since there's no direct correlation between uh, what's in the urine and what's actually going on in the CNS. And and these receptors are so complex, it's not a matter of having a high or low level of a neurotransmitter. Uh, it's it, it's it's much more granular than just measuring a neurotransmitter and then ordering a supplement that the same company that is actually testing is actually recommending. So it's a little bit of a of a firewall that should take place uh, in my mind. Uh, so glutamate is, again, it's one of these things that there's, it, the, the pharmacology of glutamate is very complex. There are different glutamate receptors. Um, and I think that the key thing is to know uh, if a patient's in an excitatory state, because a lot of these conditions are excitatory. Uh, the ion channel genes predict a, a, a higher vulnerability for an excitatory state. Um, so it's a useful surrogate marker for things like what we call bipolar, even though it's not a diagnostic test for bipolar. We know bipolar is associated with high glutamate. Um, but measuring glutamate in the urine, um, I'm not exactly sure if I would do that, to be honest with you. I mean, I don't know what the, what the other panelists feel. I don't measure neurotransmitters on anyone because usually you can have a good sense of what's going wrong by sitting with the patient and listening. Um, and there's not good evidence that uh, they're going to help us in a treatment decision um, in any way. At least that's been my clinical experience. So I think it's where one of the mistakes we make is that testing, like Jay's assay, is really great for complicated patients. Um, but when you have somebody in your office and, and they're struggling in some way with the depression, it, that's not, I don't need a lot of lab tests to diagnose that. You know, I want to check a B12 level and a TSH and then give really good uh, basic clinical care um, where these factors are really helpful. And I think where we're really dropping the ball is things like, um, like for example, I've got a 10 month old son. We have a little gluten intolerance in our family. No clinician ever said, you know, Let's make sure and really be clear on the B12 levels and everybody. And let's see, does your kid have a celiac issue? Now, I'd want to know that right now, right? Because right now is where we would intervene, but that's never even been really suggested. So I think that's where we need to do a much better job with the tools that we have um, implementing them and where there's, I think, been a little bit of an over-enthusiasm of some, some tests that really don't have evidence that they help. And I like the L-methylfolate. That's, that's a cool emerging story. <laughs> you want to add to that? Um, I think, I know there's some people who swear by that test. I feel really reluctant um, to rely too much upon it. And I would just say um, there's a lot of tests out there. And um, I usually am prioritizing the tests that I do. Um, I don't feel like I want to spend thousands and thousands of dollars of my patients' money. So I, you know, I'm usually really limiting myself. And that is just not one of my top tests. All right, we'll come back to you, Kels. Let's have a question here, Dr. Nazareth. Yes, I have a couple of questions for the panel. One is for, is this autism, is it uh, genetics with uh, environmental factors? Because uh, 
most of the uh, medical literature mainly pushing towards genetics. And I don't see autistic patients growing up and marrying each other. Uh, most of those ones that marry each other and have autism are usually in Silicon Valley somewhere. So <laughs> the other question with the kale, can you have too much of kale? I mean, it's, uh, you said 40 shades of kale. 50, 50. 50, 50 shades, shades of kale, just saying. Even more. Kale erotica, but it's it does, a whole new it does have an effect. It does have an effect on the thyroid, just like the other cruciferous vegetables. Wouldn't it be better to have kale with chocolate, maybe? Uh, that would have even a b more beneficial effect. You want to do kale first? All right, so uh, current evidence no, says... One, one question for Jay Lombard now. Uh, oh, so I think that the genetics of autism is very important, um, to, and we should not underemphasize it. Uh, the, the struggle that the basic scientists uh, have with genetic testing in autism is, is twofold. One, we should not call autism a single disorder. It is not one disorder. There are many, many subtypes of autism, at least dozens, probably. Um, and the, the genetics that we know about this reflects those sub-endophenotypes. The issue is, I think this goes back to the question earlier about diagnostic testing. Don't order a test if you don't know what to do with the information that you get. So we're still struggling with, if we get genetic data for these autism subtypes, what are the meaningful interventions that we could take that will affect the arc of the disease as opposed to not having that data? Um, and we're still, we're close to that point, but I don't think we're fully there yet. There's some examples of, of genetic testing that I think would be very helpful. Uh, for autism. I think celiac testing, I agree with everyone on this panel, uh, is a key issue here for a lot of neuropsychiatric problems. There's some genetics related to carnitine uh, and carnitine defects in certain autistic children with language delay. But I think we have to be, you know, the translational, uh, it's like what, what Rich is talking about. We, we got to really kind of take some baby steps there to, to really wed the genetic data with asking the question, how will that information change our management? Then why are the numbers going up so drastically? <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm just going to, yeah, yeah I want to I comment on that because we have spent, you know, decades now really focusing on genetics. But um, when you see the numbers going up like this, uh, and it's been looked at, is it better diagnosis and all of that, it can't explain this kind of increase. You can't have a genetic epidemic. So there has to be a combination of genetic vulnerability and environmental factors that are working together. And that's why I think in all this time there's been this obsession with genetics, partly because I think no one wants to talk about environment. Um, but I mean, it, you're, you, they are um, several really good identical twin studies that pretty much rule out that this is primarily a genetic disorder. So we need to be thinking, I think, about a whole picture type of issue and not focusing only on the genetics. I mean, yes, it's true that there are some kids who are very vulnerable, maybe more vulnerable, but um, it's definitely, I think, more environmental. The last question is for Jay Lombard is, <laughs> uh, I know genome mine, I think I'm going to use that, uh, your lab, because it looks like it's very, very important to do those tests. Uh, but uh, more important also is to look at other factors in psychiatry, the gut, brain uh, combination, the nutritional problem, methylation problems. And um, have you ever combined that with spec scans that Eamon talks about so much? Uh, well, stay tuned because we are, you know, going into the, the next generation, next reiteration of our diagnostic panel, which will be much more inclusive uh, for integrative doctors. Our, our first panel was really primarily for conventional psychiatry, looking at uh, genetics related to pharmacokinetics, drug metabolism. Uh, Spec scan, I'll be honest with you, I think is, is not a great clinical tool. Um, it, do, it lacks diagnostic uh, specificity. It's very sensitive for what it's measuring, but to use that test to diagnose things like ADHD is really an, a, a wasted resource. Um, and I'm sure uh, you know, I'd like to hear what you know, Drew feels about, you know, thinks about that because you're seeing patients on a day-to-day -day basis. But, you know, really diagnostic testing, whatever that diagnostic testing is, for, is for patients who are complicated. It's not the straightforward patient with major depression or a condition, you know, don't do testing just for the sake of doing testing. It's really useful when we suspect that there may be an underlying dementia, for instance. When is a spec or, or brain imaging, if a patient has, you know, early depression or other psychiatric symptoms, 
that's the prodrome of Alzheimer's disease. We know it's a very common or early presentation of Alzheimer's is to have psychiatric problems first. That's where imaging becomes very valuable. Drew, you want to jump in? I know you're itching to talk about kale yeah, and I'm thyroid. Get, I'm gonna get, like, I do a lot more than prescribe <laughs> kale. I just want to say it's like my, my whole shtick is like, hey, about your mom and about the kale. So uh, first of all, there's no, there's no evidence that kale can cause hypothyroidism. That's, that's a theoretical risk because kale, kale can interfere with thyroid absorption. So theoretically, if someone ate a very, very low iodine diet and ate a lot, a lot of kale, probably not even eating kale, you'd have to juice like a bushel of kale every single day then potentially you could get into problem. There's been one case report at NYU of a woman eating three kilograms of bok choy every day, and she had a lot of medical problems. She was 82. So kale uh, it's been frustrating, I would say, because there's been a kind of kale backlash, and that's been frustrating in the sense that, like, so we're finally talking about something besides, like, donuts, and we're talking about a healthy food, and people are excited about it. And I bump into people all the time who say, oh, well, but kale's really bad for my thyroid. Or a woman who said, you know, you don't really absorb any nutrients from kale, right? And that's, like, one of the healthiest foods on the planet. So, again, it's a theoretical risk that I think got headlines. There was even a headline, can kale kill you? <laughs> and, and I think it's really trying to, it, it, so it took a little wind out of our sails. But <laughs> the bottom line is right now, no, there have been no reports. And uh, it's where we need better trials in the sense no one's ever done a kale trial. But a lot of women in their 40s and 50s get hypothyroidism, right? A lot of women in their 40s and 50s now eat more kale. And so that's a correlation that, that really doesn't prove any causation. Um, yeah, and also we have a very low iodine diet, and how do you uh, overcome this? I like to eat my kale with seafood, and then you just don't have to ever worry about it. That's and, good. And chocolate. and chocolate. In terms of scanning, I don't use any scans diagnostically unless in very, very complicated cases. I, I agree with Jay. That's something that uh, it's an exciting thing to show patients a picture of their brain, uh, but currently there is, uh, it, it, um, it's at times I think very misleading. I've seen a lot of patients who've had scans and it's really led to a tremendous amount of misinformation and anxiety and uh, concern that, again, good clinical care sort of took care of what a scan could not. I yeah. think in a glass of wine. Yeah, I, kale, little mussels, little glass of wine, I think. Yeah. I, will that prevent my Alzheimer's? Come to my office, okay. we'll talk. <laughs> yeah. one, one quick thing about chocolate. Um, so oftentimes you'll look at a chocolate yeah. bar. I know that most of us in the room understand this, but you know, there's sugar and butter, more sugar and butter, and then there's a little bit of chocolate in, at the end on, on the last ingredient. Um, dark cocoa powder, for, for specifically if I'm talking about Alzheimer's disease, the pure cocoa flavonoids uh, can improve blood pressure control. That's a, that's a bonus. Memory function, oh yeah, and insulin resistance. So uh, cocoa flavonoids, plus my, I'm gonna dip my, since I like this. Uh, a chocolate, chocolate covered kale chip for you maybe? Uh, I'm ready, <laughs> I'm ready. Dark yeah. chocolate covered. No charge for the visit. Yeah. <laughs> what about Dutch chocolate? Which chocolate? Cows? Don't know. Yeah, it sounds good, though. Uh, yeah, for uh, Dr. J. Lombard. Yeah, the chart you had uh, at the beginning uh, involving the glutamate and the calcium and the tendency towards apoptosis, and then the mitigating factors that could uh, push it in the other direction. I was wondering what the role of lithium was on that chart. Could you clarify that? Absolutely. So lithium is a neuroprotective compound. Uh, in fact, there's data that uh, in low uh, lithium geographical areas is higher rates of depression and suicidality. Um, so lithium should be considered an essential nutrient. Uh, but lithium actually uh, blocks glutamate in a number of different ways. Uh, one is it affects um, something in the endoplasmic reticulum uh, called IP3, which is a, um, a, a signal cascade that releases calcium into the cell. So one of the effects that lithium has to re reduce glutamate is downstream by preventing this excess amount of calcium release. So lithium is a very, very important agent and probably one of the best, you know, augmentation strategies for depression that psychiatry has ever discovered. I got to say it into the mic so everyone streaming can hear. Do you have an idea what the ideal maximum dose could be? So I, I actually would again defer to to Drew because he's in we don't clinical practice. generally dose anybody with lithium, but you can get lots of lithium in traditional mineral waters. And I it's one of these things. Lithium has a bad name, right? It's one of these drugs. Like, everyone has a lithium level. Everyone in this yep. room, everyone listening, you've got a little bit of lithium in you. And right. we used to eat uh, and drink a lot more of our minerals in these traditional mineral waters. If you actually look, uh, so Seven Up. 
used to be called like lithiated like seven citrus soda or something. So we have these, anytime you go to some place with an old hot springs, they advertise their lithiated water. And that's how we, we discovered lithium's effects as it was mistakenly given as a salt. And the miners who got lithium, you know, they were just kind of calmer and they liked being in the mine more. So, uh, so we, we but, but generally we don't dose or give lithium as a, as a supplement unless somebody has a depression or a bipolar disorder. Like 600 to 1500 is about where we dose lithium for the most part. questions come through the uh, mic, otherwise no one can hear it at home. So, uh, Dr. Teach. Uh, Jay, I was, I was listening to you, and I listened to the idea that we're dealing with harmonics. So you're saying a little too much of this or a little of that. That fits in with this very much. Yep. <clears throat> the other thing is I haven't heard anyone speaking of uh, electromagnetic frequencies, which I think with the cell phones and everything are going to be vitally important from the environment, and also mold in the environment. I can reproduce symptoms on and off. I can reproduce depression. I can make them laugh and happy in the houses and in my office with putting it under the skin. I think that's really important. You can have the genetic problem problems, but if you take away the environmental problems, very often you can get them back to normal without uh, even attacking the genetics themselves. What are, what are some of the big environmental issues there, Maya? Can I ask you that for, for, for kids, um, and particularly with neurodegenerative diseases? What do you see as the bigger environmental insults? Um, I think that antibiotics, chronic antibiotics and steroids are a really big deal because they're affecting the gut in really profound ways. Um, I do think mold is a big issue, can be a big issue, um, but I do think also that you have to have uh, an immune system that's already a little bit sick to respond as badly to mold as some people do. Uh, it is can that genetic or is that transgenerational epigenetic? I think it's both. Um, and um, let's see what else, oh, and the EMF, yeah, I mean, I actually think what screen, like screening, Just screen time. <laughs> Yeah, well, and I think that kind of goes with EMFs, too. I mean, I think there's both of that, and that's profound for children. I mean, it's incredible. Um, and the data about EMFs is kind of growing now that, you know, especially prenatal um, is connected with neurodevelopmental issues. I hate to say it, but yeast. I think it's very important, and we've seen some children totally turn around by treating the yeast. Well, I think that that is true, but again, I mean, what we're taught, what at least the way I'm looking at treating kids is rather than trying to kind of play whack-a-mole with like 40 different problems, is to try to strengthen them and get them more resilient, um, because otherwise you're chasing after a lot of things, and in the meantime, while we're treating yeast, we're giving them antifungals, and then, you know, they have an overgrowth of something else, and then, I'm not saying that's always true, and I do think treating yeast can sometimes be pretty transformative. I think that, you know, gut flora in general need to be in balance, um, and there are microbes and other things, but um, I think that if you have a body out of balance, and you are not resilient, then that's when all those things start to really go wrong. But that's not the root issue. The root issue is underlying. Um, so I think that that is for sure. All of these things are issues. I do think screen time is, is kind of a nightmare for a lot of these kids, though. Can I ask you, Dr. Lombard, because we did an interview earlier uh, just before this, and you, 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 know, you started by talking about disconnection as sort of like the, the grounding factor in these neuropsych issues. Can you just speak a little bit about some of your thoughts with regard to connectivity and technological, technological connectivity as regards um, neurodevelopmental or neurological disease? Sure. I mean, it's it's a scary issue because obviously, uh, you know, children are sort of the canary in the coal mine, right? And we're sort of looking at these increased risks of autism, which that number is astronomically frightening. And and the issue is, I think we all need to accept that this is a multifactorial disorder. Uh, no one, I think, in this room, whether it's Alzheimer's or autism, would say that it's strictly genetics or, or strictly environment. It's always an interaction of 
genes and environment that is producing increased vulnerability for almost all these conditions. But what we talked about earlier, which um, is not my theory, so I think it's uh, Dr. Cohen from Cambridge uh, that talked, I think it was Dr. Cohen, talked about the increased risk uh, of autism correlating with our technological and digital revolution. That uh, we as a society uh, are uh, becoming more digitalized in terms of how we think of things. Uh, I had the opportunity to sit in a uh, webinar last week and there was a graphic of an axon with ones and zeros. And uh, it made me think that, wow, we really kind of got taking such a reductionistic idea that consciousness is purely computational. Um, and that's what most neuroscientists believe, that our consciousness is, is, is a computate, our brain's a computational, uh, biological computational organ. And that really frightens me, that concept. Because if it's true, then what we're saying is that autism is really a, uh, an evolutionary response to how we are thinking about ourselves. Um, and that is something we should, should give us pause, meaning that this type of behavior, the automated type of behaviors where uh, everything is you know, uh, black or white, there's, there's no nuances to communication or socialization, uh, may be the brain's uh, reaction to the technological revolution that we're experiencing. And you know, I hope that theory is not right. <laughs> Dr. Isaacson, have you got any thoughts on that? I mean, it's a bit outside the box for you, but I'd imagine you'd be into it. <laughs> I'm like, I gotta like hold on to my seat after that one. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, oh boy. Yeah, I, when, it, when it comes to all of these things, um, I stress over and over that it, it, it's just like you said, it took the words right out of my mouth, it's not binary. You're always in this tug of war. And you're playing tug of war with your genes, and if you got good shoes, well, that means you didn't do this bad thing. And if you if you, if you worked out and you're eating your protein and doing whatever you need to do, then then that you got that in your favor. Um, it's really complicated. Yeah, that's all I can say. Well, uh, yeah, no, I I certainly appreciate that, and that's you know one of the one of the things about this this functional medicine movement is is training doctors to think in a systems biology way, try and think about different systems and how they work together. And so, um, you know, we're right on the, uh, on the forefront of that. We've got a couple more questions. Dr. Vaughan Bowman, he's a naturopath here from Connecticut, building a massive center to help out some people in Stanford, Connecticut. They need it. <laughs> Thank you, James. Uh, two quick mineral-related questions, uh, one for you uh, and one for Dr. Lombard as well. First question, regarding the lithium, because you said upward limit of 600 milligrams Inorganic. What about an organic or elemental form of lithium, and do you find it? Oh, I, I don't mean to make an uh, upward limit. I think is based on level uh, when you're dosing, and and so I was just sort of throwing out that you know when I dose people with lithium, I start out 600, 900, and go up um, based on blood level. So. And do you have any thoughts on an organic or an elemental form of lithium, and how it might compare? <sighs> Not really, Kelly. You probably know. I, you know, I'm a lithium carbonate man. <laughs> say that unfortunately while it's a compelling idea based on the epidemiologic studies mostly in Texas right to use um, lithium elementally I think you would agree right there's not not much data in fact no data so for the most part when clinicians use it it's like in the five milligram to like 20 30 milligram range right um, and I found just anecdotally that it can be helpful for sort of like lability, irritability, but it's not really a compelling evidence-based uh, intervention. It's, it's coming around. The, the, uh, the evidence for lithium in low doses, it's starting to hit a little tiny bit with Alzheimer's, but I have to hold my breath because there's a dearth of evidence. I mean, there's just, it's just not there yet, but five, ten years from now, we'll see. Excellent. That was my, yeah, I was wondering if it's just a matter of research catching up and, and physicians using it without, right. And it's why uh, it changed, right? Just like iodine changed, like correct. our relationship with these fundamental, I mean, they call a lithium a primordial element, right? Because right. it was formed when like the <laughs> big bang happened. So I like the idea that that's part of us or should be part of us, but we've taken it out of everything. Right. Uh, second question, uh, Dr. Lombard, the idea of magnesium playing the bouncer for a, a calcium channel. Is that simply just because, okay, this is another competing cation? Uh, in, in also, is there a form that you would prefer in terms of absorption and assimilation for that very purpose? So magnesium is a what's called a non-allosteric uh, inhibitor of NMDA receptors. So it's similar to a drug called Nemenda, memantine, for Alzheimer's disease. It has similar pharmacology in terms of reducing 
uh, glutamate uh, mediated calcium influx into neurons. Regarding calcium, uh, magnesium absorption, I mean, that's something that probably you would know much better than I would, to be honest with you, uh, whether it's magnesium glycinate. I've heard people talk about that having a higher absorption rate. Um, and, you know, probably ask one of the clinicians would be better. So, um, we can't hear, we won't be able to hear it at home, unfortunately. Magnesium for the brain. So there's a, there's a, a researcher from MIT that was doing work on something called magnesium 3 and 8. Right, and he was, you know, in animals at least, was showing that there's higher blood-brain barrier uh, penetration through the three and eight form of magnesium. Um, but I'm not sure if that would would justify the expense of just taking regular magnesium. Maya, what you know? Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends on the on the gut health of <laughs> the person. I mean, glycinate is what I use when I feel like there's. A, well, first of all, I mean, you can start giving chelated magnesium or you know, magnesium citrate or other things, and if the person has loose stool, then you know they're probably not absorbing it um, all that well, and then you might move to something like magnesium glycinate, but I mean, if we're gonna be mindful of what kind of money people are spending on these supplements, you might start with something more basic. I sometimes will also use magnesium taurate, right. you know, if I'm looking to kind of do a really like, you know, calm the neuroexcitatory response, and that can sometimes give you a lot of bang for your buck. What's everybody's favorite food with magnesium? <laughs> Chocolate. <laughs> What's your favorite, Drew? I like dark, dark chocolate. Pumpkin seeds, I think, are a yeah. good source. Leafy greens. Kale. All right. Hey, this has been a, an unbelievably good conversation, and I appreciate everyone in the room with the questions and the questions on Twitter. I have to say, if you're interested in like the role of the gut and the microbiome and, and, and inflammation, if you can get onto our YouTube channel, Dr. Kelly Brogan's got um, her talk from, the evolu from, from uh, April is got the most YouTube video views of any of us, so that's a it's a it's a great one to check that out if you're if you're passionate about it. I really want to thank uh, Max and the whole panel here. Can we have a round of applause for everyone here on the team? It's been a beautiful forum. Thank you so much to Neuhaus and all the sponsors for having us. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions, but um, we'll see you on November 5th, where we're going to outline our uh, plan for world domination. So we'll see you then. <laughs>